Hey, it's good to be in church, isn't it? It's good to be in church. Okay, guys. I know of no more potent killer than isolation. There is no more destructive influence on physical and mental health than the isolation of you from me and of us from them. It has been shown to be a central agent in the etiology of depression, paranoia, schizophrenia, rape, suicide, mass murder and a wide variety of disease states. The devil's strategy for our times is to trivialise human existence and to isolate us from one another while creating the delusion that the reasons are time pressures, work demands or economic anxieties. Philip Zimbardo, psychologist from Stanford University, wrote that in a book in 1980. It's a very potent reality of our world. But let's move on to a more light-hearted mood. Harrods. Harrods is a very exclusive place. I don't know if any of you have been to Harrods. I haven't been to Harrods myself personally. But Harrods, well, a friend of mine worked for Harrods a, a number of years ago and he used to tell me the kind of clientele that they would get there regularly, spending thousands upon thousands of pounds on suits and jewellery and homewares and even to get a box of tea could set you back from uh, as much as six quid for 50 tea bags. I know, it's not your regular Tesco's. <laughs> it's a very exclusive place and in fact it's so exclusive that although any of us are able to walk in through their doors and purchase stuff, you need to be dressed a certain way to be allowed entrance. I know. Could you see yourself there? Would, would, would you like to see yourself there? <laughs> IKEA, on the other hand, is a very <laughs> inclusive sort of place. Uh, it, it's the new year, you see, and, and this year I've, I've already been to IKEA, uh, you, you know, it's, it's great. I actually, despite my, my uh, reservations about wanting to go, I, I actually quite enjoy going to IKEA. Because what IKEA do, they don't just sell you stuff, they sell you a lifestyle. You get a walk around, don't you, and you get to, to see everything laid out nice, you know, the ladies like all that element of it. You know, oh, I could have my bed looking just like that, or the, the wardrobe's there, or the shelf like that. Put the TV on a unit that's nice, and, and, sh and then you have to go home and make it. But that, that's the guy part. We like going down into the warehouse bit where it smells a bit man, and like there's boxes of stuff and numbers on the boxes, and we're like, yeah, yeah, love, it's aisle 48. We're going this way. Yeah, yeah. We're going. Uh, oh, I'm lost. But. I, IKEA is a very inclusive place. Their vision statement is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And their business idea is to offer a wide range of well-designed functional home furnishing products at prices so low that as many people as possible will be able to afford them. I think it's a very inclusive place. Many of us might have found ourselves excluded in life from something. When I was a younger man, I used to be a bit of an Oasis fan. I know, you wouldn't think it to look at me now, but back in the day, you know, you could see me strutting around like Liam. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. The Sevilla. Uh, the thing is, is I bought tickets to go to a gig once, and I was supposed to have been the driver uh, with a few mates, and they lived a few miles away from me, so the idea was I was going to go and pick them up, and then we'd go uh, and watched the gig somewhere. And uh, the week before the gig was due to happen, or a few days before, my car broke down. And I, I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't take them. And I, I didn't go. They found a lift, and they wouldn't go out of their way to come and pick me up. I know. I know. It's sad. It's sad. But we've all had that feeling of being excluded from something, particularly something that we really wanted to be a part of. And not only have I been excluded 
of being an excluder. When I was at school, we used to have a little group of friends, as many of us do when we're at school, and there was one particular friend called Brian, Brian Randall. If you're listening to this, Brian, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what happened was, this guy, he was, uh, he was alienated from most groups. He was a little bit nerdy, he was a little bit large, and most people didn't want him to be part of their friendship circle because he was just a bit odd. And I was friends with him, privately, but publicly, I, I wouldn't be his friend. It's horrible, isn't it? Aren't kids mean? Kids. Mean, mean kids. So, I think most of us have experienced this, knowing what it's like to be excluded and being the excluder. And it's, it's horrible when you think back on these things, at the way that you could have been, you should have been, maybe, what would have happened, I don't know, all these questions that might have run through our minds, particularly at the time. But I want to talk today about the greatest includer who, who ever walked the earth. Jesus was a man who was very inclusive. I, I want to go through a, a couple of instances of his life, particularly when he first met his, his disciples, his first disciples. So there's John the baptizer, baptizing people with the River Jordan. John the baptizer, he'd got together a group of like disciples, a group of mates who were like going to follow him. And like, yeah, we're with you, John. We're with you all the way. You're like, go on, what, whatever it is you want to do, we will be right by your side. And then Jesus comes along, and John baptizes Jesus in the river. And then a couple of days after that, Jesus is walking past again. Like, I don't know what was going on. Like maybe he was just like you know, like just walking past, you know, on the on the beach, on the on the seashore. Like, yeah, guys, remember me? I was here a couple of days ago. Baptized me in, in the river. I don't know. Who knows what Jesus was like? But anyway, a couple of John's disciples see Jesus, and they're like, "Dude, dude, you're you're the one." Like, John loves you, and like we was with John all the way. But forget him. We're with you. We want to be with you, right? Andrew was like. Oh, this guy's amazing. I've got to go and get my brother. So he runs and he goes and gets his brother, Simon Peter. So he brings Simon Peter to Jesus. And Jesus is like, I like you, Simon Peter, but I don't like your name. I'm going to change your name. He's never met this dude before. Like, all he's got is his brother's like, account of who this guy is. He got baptised a couple of days ago. Some, some guy from like, Galilee. You know, who is he? Tony? You look like a, a stellar dude, but I think I'm going to start calling you Frank. Is that all right? Fine. Cool. All right, Frank. So then it, it moves on a couple more days. And uh, oh, so after that, they, they all go and, and they meet Nathaniel. And uh, Nathaniel is just sitting there and he's like, man, what good can come out of Nazareth? Like, what kind of dirt hole is that? Like, nothing good comes from Nazareth. And Jesus is like, you, you, Nathaniel, come, come with me. Come be part of my posse. And he's like, sweet, like that. A few days after that, Jesus is walking along by the seashore again. And he sees James and John and Peter and his brother, Andrew. And they're all like out in the boats, you know, doing what they do, fishing and stuff. And... Uh, Jesus is walking along the seashore. Lads! Hey! Lads! Come here! Peter's like, oh, mate, he's going to start calling me Peter again, isn't he? Like, then, my name's Simon. So anyway, they, they, they draw a bit closer, and Jesus is like, lads! Come, come follow me. Come, be, be with me. Like, I'm going to do something that's it's going to change the world. Like, you've got no idea what you're going to be a part of, but it's going to be awesome, man. Come on. You're in. And they're like, well, all right, I can, I can handle having my name changed if it's going to like, change the world. Maybe this is the guy. Like, Pete's thinking, my, my brother Andrew and, and Philip, they, they think that he's the Messiah. Like, they've already thought that. Like, maybe this guy is the one that's going to like, rescue us from Roman occupation. He's going to take us into new places and it's going to be amazing. Love it. And they get included into what Jesus is doing. A bit further on, down the line, 
Jesus interacts with a guy called Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus, he is like the great included in like the, the people of the day. Like the Pharisees were like, everybody looks at the Pharisees, they're like, these guys, they are God's people. Like they, they've got it down. Like 630 laws, they got more than that. They make up their own laws and they keep them as well. They're like, yeah, they're the most godly people in the world. We want to be a part of that. But of course, like in the education system, not everybody could be a Pharisee. So Nicodemus, he hears about what Jesus is doing. Right? And he comes to him like a spy in the middle of the night. I don't know what Jesus was doing in the middle of the night. I don't know, maybe just wandering around. He, he seems to wander around a lot. But like, what happens is, is Nicodemus comes up to Jesus in the middle of the night. He's like, no one's watching. Jesus, you're like, you're being talked about. People think that maybe you've been sent from God. And Jesus is like, well, I'm going to talk in riddles to you and maybe you'll understand it, maybe you won't. At the end of that... I really believe that Nicodemus was included in what Jesus was doing. And I've got reason to think that as well. The reason I can think that Nicodemus was included in what Jesus was doing from that moment to the end was Nicodemus was one of the two people that spent a shed load of money on like all the, the spices and the, the burial stuff to bury Jesus into Josephus' tomb at the end of it all. Yeah. Like, Someone that doesn't believe and doesn't follow and isn't included in what's going on for all of that time does not spend that much money in burying someone that they do not like, do they? Nicodemus was part of the gang, he was part of the posse, he was like Jesus' man in, in high places. <coughs> Jesus is walking along the seashore again. A lot seems to happen by the seashore in this area of the world. Maybe it's like South End on Sea or something. But he's walking along, and, and there's Levi, the tax collector, despised, hated. No one liked tax collectors. Who are these people? They're, they're mean. They're thieves. Pfft. Who'd hang out with them? Dirty, rotten tax collectors. They're worse than sinners. Jesus is walking along, and he's like, Matthew? Got me little gang? Do you want to be a part of it? Sweet. Come. Follow me. And therefore Matthew becomes part of the gang. And this little gang, they're like, they're the guys. They're like the desperados of the day. Like crowds are following Jesus everywhere he goes. And Jesus, he talks to them all. He addresses them in, in big sermons and a massive sort of extravagant environments. He says, guys, the kingdom of God is at hand. and You can be a part of it. You all can be a part of it. You just need to repent and come, follow me. It's all good. You don't have to get your stuff together before this happens. You can just come as you are. But... But think the life that you've been living, it's not really leading you anywhere, is it? How about if you join with me, become included in our little family, you can do amazing things. Your life will be transformed, radically different. I love Jesus. He is the most inclusive guy that's ever walked the earth. Doesn't mean he had to approve of everything that everybody did. He called them to repentance. Yeah. But he wouldn't leave them where they were if they wanted to be included. Yeah. It's great, isn't it? Love this guy. Now, Jesus is in a synagogue one Saturday. And uh, he stands up in the middle of church. It's like, got a word. You know that scroll, Isaiah? Well, that scroll Isaiah, today, today guys, let's open it up, so he opens up the scroll, and he says, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim 
good news to the poor. And people in this synagogue, they're like, whoa, hold on. Like, are you really, what are you, what are you saying? Are you saying you, like me? Or are you saying like Isaiah, like me? Jesus is like, no, it's like me, like me. God has anointed me, Jesus, to bring good news to the poor. And the truth is, is that Jesus has anointed you to bring good news to the poor too. Because Jesus is that kind of inclusive guy that if you're part of his family, then you've got the same power that he had to do the things that he did. And this is the vision of our church. We've got a mission of being authentic disciples, devoted to God and loving people. We want to love people. But we want to love the people that Jesus loved. Which is all people, of course. But he says, I've been anointed to proclaim good news to the poor, the broken-hearted, the downcast, the outcast, anybody and everybody. This is who we are to be, church. Disciples of Jesus, part of his posse, part of his gang. He's called each of us. He's walked along the seashore and gone, Andrea, want to be in my gang? Let's go. I don't know what he looked like, maybe he had a bit of swagger. It's like... Steve, you want to you be part of this thing? Yeah? Come on then, let's go. And, <laughs> and off I go. And Jesus has approached us and said, do you want to be a part of this thing? Inclusivity is one of our values as a church, which is why we're talking about it today. As the new year starts, we want to start talking about the values of the church a bit more and more, along with the intimacy and the investment and the intentional mission. These are all things that we do and we practice as a church. Yet, we want to be more on purpose with these things. We don't want to just, like, just because we're, we're nice people, we don't want to just do it just, just because we do. We want to do it because God has called us to. God has asked us, he said, Hub Church, you are a place in, in a wilderness. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you look around society, society is very far from God. We are several generations removed from the generation that, that nearly everybody attended church. Whether or not they fully believed, and they were, you know, born again of the Spirit, we're not entirely sure, but, but a, a huge proportion of this nation's people, residents, used to belong in church. They'd heard the gospel, they knew the gospel, they knew it inside out. They could talk to people about the gospel. In fact, their biblical literacy was at a high point about 50, 60 years ago, just before the Second World War. Like, there were loads of people that believed the gospel. And today, man, like, we've got several churches in this town and several magnificent buildings that we see that, that proclaim the, the glory of God, yet nobody really realises that it's for the glory of God anymore. Because the nation has lost its heart for the glory of God. And we are God's representatives here. We are the ones to be the, the bringers of the good news. Your feet have been anointed. Your lips have been anointed. You can take good news that people can be included into Jesus' family as much now as at any other point in history. And the good thing about the state of affairs in our country, if there is any such thing as a good thing, spiritually speaking, is that there's greater opportunity for us than ever before. No longer will you go to work and, and speak to people about the goodness of God and they'll say, yeah, I know. Because they don't. They've got no idea. It is up to us, church, to be those people, to include people into what God is doing. 
And Franklin Roosevelt, President of the United States, a number of years ago, said, we are trying to construct a more inclusive society. We are going to make a country in which no one is left out. Yet, I would like to replace the word country and, and replace it with the word church. We are trying to construct a more inclusive society. We, as the Hub Church, are going to make a church in which no one is left out. Too many people are left out. Too many chairs are empty. There's too much space in here. Man, it would be awesome. Tuesday, we had a prayer meeting at my house. There was no space, man. There was no space. Like, we all walked out there with stiff legs. It was all like, you know, tight. Tight as it could be. And that would be awesome if this church was like that. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be fantastic if we turned up on a Sunday morning and we couldn't sit down? And we'd have to say, we've got a problem. Well, what's the problem? There's too many people here. That's, that's no problem. We'll just, we'll have another service. It's all good. Two services. Okay, cool. We've got a problem. Two services. They're full. That's no problem. We're free. We've got a problem. Man, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah? Would you like to see that? Would you like to be a part of that? You have an opportunity, church, to be a part of that. We've all got these invitation cards on our seats. I talk about it like all the time. I know it gets irritating after a while, but man, I'm going to keep talking about it. Take them away. Invite people. I've invited five people this week. None of them are here, but that's beside the point. That is beside the point. We've just got to do it. One day, through your prayers and through your faithfulness, people will see your life and they will go, do you know what? Have you got one of them? I'll come along, I'll check it out. Who knows? I don't know. Let's try it. Why not? What it will mean is it will mean there will be more messy lives. It will mean more broken hearts. It will mean more time and more sacrifice required on our part to help with the new people that are meeting Jesus for the first time. When Jesus met Levi, Matthew, he, Matthew had a party full of all the wrong people. But Jesus went. He was like, do you know what? I'm going to go be a part of that. And do you know what? The funny thing is, this is a quote that a preacher I listen to sometimes says. He says that people that were nothing like Jesus like Jesus. And he liked them back. Yeah. And shouldn't that be our posture? Come on. The people that are nothing like us like us. And we like them back. Amen. And then we can help people with their brokenness, with their messy lives, with the things that they're struggling with, physically and spiritually. But because we're a small number... It will take more sacrifice and more effort on our part. Philip Zimbardo said, The devil's strategy for our times is to trivialise human existence and to isolate us from one another while creating the delusion that the reasons are time pressures, work demands or economic anxieties. God is our provider. He will give you what is required to help people. People are what really matter to God. You are the 99 sheep. There is one out there that we're to go after. He cares for that one. There's a party that happens when that one is found. You are nine coins. There is one out there that is lost. We don't worry about, we don't have that emotional connection with that that is lost until we lose it. But don't you know that there are people amongst us that are not here anymore? How do we feel about that? Do we care even? Are we like, oh well, shame, they went, never mind. Or do we chase them down? That sounds a bit rough. (laughs) Do we go after them? And say, come on, you're part of this family. Please, don't, don't go away, don't be excluded from the family, you're a part of it. We want you to be included in this thing that God's doing here amongst us. There are many prodigal sons. 
Let's not be the brother that stayed behind. But there are many that have never been sons or daughters. It's our job, church. It is our job. Because no one else is going to do it. And if we bemoan the demise of the church in our nation, we've got no one to blame but ourselves. We can't complain about the fact that no one's in church. You might say, well, it's not my fault. It was the generation before us. But then what would a generation after you say? And the generation after that? It happened in Turkey. Once upon a time, Turkey was the hotbed of Christianity. Not anymore. Let us not go that way. Amen. So, it all starts, being inclusive starts with being included. When I was new to this church, I had no idea of what was required. I had no idea of what you're supposed to do. It was all a bit weird. People were holding their hands up in the sky and shabba dabba doing and like all sorts of like crazy stuff going on. I'm like, what? What, what is this? I was just here because like, I, was, I was after some fit bird. And, <laughs> and, and th- th- like, this is true though, isn't it? When we first come to church, we've got no idea. Yeah, yeah. W- weird. Like, weird. Now, like, where else do you go and you have a karaoke bar, right, where you're all like singing songs together with words on the screen, and you sit down and you have some guy just lecture you for half an hour, yeah. making you feel really uncomfortable about yourself. Who does that? <laughs> Really? So we've got to be mindful to be really inclusive. When I was new here, that, that was what I thought. Like, what a weird place. But people included me immediately. I had questions. People answered questions. I got invited along to Connect Group. That Connect Group was amazing. Then I got invited to another Connect Group, and that was great as well. And, you know. but, but people like, like Matt and Ian and Ruth and, and, and Tall Paul, who's not here with us anymore, sadly, but, but guy, phone him up, like, say, hey, bro, how are you doing? Like, but, but people like that included me in what they were doing. People like you included me in what you were doing. And 10 years later down the line, I can say, thank you so much, because, do you know what? I, I feel like, you know, God has really done stuff in my life. Amen. My life is a testimony to all those that used to know me. Like, it's incredible what God has done. So it all starts by being included. So, how do we do this? I hear you ask. I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Will you start off by being likeable and making friends in your workplace, in your neighbourhood, where you hang out, down the pub, in your car toddler group, down the coffee shop, walking along the seashore like Jesus? Who knows? You know. But you make, make friends. Just make friends. I don't mean you have to be like BFFs with them or anything. Just like, you know, be friendly and approachable. And have conversations with people. That's where it starts. And you don't have to be weird about it either. Like, you don't have to be like, Dude, come to my church. It's the best church in the world. You get filled with the Spirit. You'd be like, amazing. You'd be like, I want to fly. Oh, it's... No. But you just make friends with people to the point where they're like, do you know what? You're, you're okay. You're not too bad. I mean, the goal isn't to be like, that guy's amazing. But you get to a place where they're like, do you know what, I I can trust you. And if you give me one of these cards, or if you say, hey, come to my church, or hey, do you want to go out and have a coffee, and I'll tell you about my life and what God has done in my life and stuff like that, people aren't freaked out by it. That's where it starts. So make friends. Invite them along to church. It's, it's not a, a huge step. Once you've made friends with someone, you know, we have this like fear thing in our way, don't we? Like, if we invite someone to church, like maybe the worship will be bad, or maybe the preaching will be bad, or maybe like maybe someone will be there that's like a bit awkward and weird, and like we have all these like barriers in our head of like reason why we shouldn't invite someone to church. But I got invited to church and I turned out all right. So why not try it? Um, Get here early to welcome, embrace, and love people that have been included. Like, if we start inviting people, and there's like two of us here, and we're running around like trying to get stuff done, that's that's, that's not cool. It's not cool. 
Hey, how are you? Yeah, nice. Off you go. Got a job to do. See you later. Take a seat. I'll get your coffee later. Let's get here early. I, this morning, right, it was, a, it, was, it was great. I was like paying attention. There was, there was a buzz, like be, before the worship started. I love that buzz. Like, that's, that's great. It's like this sense of anticipation. Church is going to start. We're just chatting about our week, like how things have gone, good things and bad things, and it's okay. Let me encourage you and all the rest of it. It's good, good stuff. I, I'd love to see that every week. It'd be incredible. Let's build a sense of anticipation about church. Let's be here early. Be available for a coffee in the week. You know, just... What else do we do? Game of Thrones, new season, it's, it's, it's on like Tuesday night. I've, I've got to see it. Well, record it. Football's on Wednesday night, Champions League. So what? You're only going to get disappointed anyway. So, talk to me. I'm a West Ham fan, it's my life. But be available. You know, the thing is, is when I say be available for it, it doesn't mean that we're going to approach you like every week and say like, every Wednesday night, you have to go down to Starbucks and speak to this person because that is the only time. No. It, no. But just be available, be approachable, be open to it. Get committed to a connect group or a Bible study or a prayer group. You know, get committed to it. Because that's a great place to invite people along, to come and be a, like, a first step. Come and do what I'm doing. It's, like, it's, not, it's not weird, it's not freaky. Sometimes we eat food and like, you know, it's all good. It's, it's a good thing to do. But get committed to one so that we can include other people. We can't include them if we're not part of it, can we? That's just crazy. You being here could be the difference in someone's salvation story. You being here, part of Sunday mornings, in a connect group, prayer meeting, wherever, could be the difference in someone's story. I'm glad that Matt and Ian were here, just to like embarrass you, but I'm glad Matt and Ian were here when I first came. Because they're part of my salvation story. I know. I'll big them up. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> but you could be that significant in someone's life. You can't say, oh, not me. I'm no one. No, God has empowered you to be someone. Yeah. There is no no ones in here. That's bad English, but it's true. <laughs> so, to wrap this up, to wrap this up at the end, I know there's a, there's a load of sweeties here. Very tempting, I know. But we need to be in the bowl. We need to be in the mix. We need to be one of these sweeties. Yeah. And we want a bowl that is diverse in sweeties, Amen. don't we? Yeah, you know, we want some love hearts, some lovey-dovey ones. We want some fizzy ones. We want some chocolatey ones. We want some with a stick in. Like, I don't know what kind of sweetie you are, but you need to be in the bowl to be included. And then we can pour more sweeties in. And we all like more sweeties, don't we? So, get involved. The broken don't need Harrods. The broken need Ikea. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Yeah. Father God, we, we thank you, God, for this value that you've placed on our hearts as a church. I, I thank you, God, that you have empowered us with the Holy Spirit just to go out and to love people. And I pray, God, that we just catch a wind of this, of this heart, Lord, to be included, to be a part of something that you're doing amongst us so that we can include other people into what's going on here. We, we thank you, God, for your heart for people. And we just want to follow after that. Let us be like Jesus and just walk along that seashore and say, come, be a part of what's going on here. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.